indeed. I will be speaking uh, today mostly about the German National Cohort, which is a large scale longitudinal study, which we have been setting up now since uh, 10 years. And um, the, this, I, I would like to frame this within the global challenges we are currently facing and which impact our health, which are the climate crisis, the aging population, the corona pandemic, and the increases in disparities and socioeconomic hardships. And to understand that, uh, my belief is that we need large scale cohort studies, such as the NACO, or the, as we say in German, the NACO Gesundheitsstudie. It's the largest health study in Germany. It's population based and a prospective cohort, which um, is is kind of operated in 18 study centers. And you see on the map here, the study regions with the main city, as well as a depiction how much urban or surrounding area is included in the study region. We um, aimed at recruiting 200,000 men and women aged 20 to 69 years, which were drawn randomly from the mandatory population registries in the defined geographical areas. And we started in 2014 with a 30 year perspective. And the whole study is funded by our federal ministry for education and research, the participating federal states, the Helmholtz Association and the participating institutions. And together we set out to um, follow four main objectives namely to identify pathways linking lifestyle and environmental risk factors to disease. And we do not specialize in any one given disease as we have done in our smaller cohorts in the past, but we try to really from the start um, focus on more or less all major diseases. We want to understand geographic and socioeconomic disparities in health and disease. Um, develop risk prediction models for personalized pre prevention and evaluate markers and tools for early detection of diseases and develop them. And um, indeed focusing on all the major diseases as you see depicted in the icons down below. Um, here you see the organizations which are participating. It's uh, the major universities which focus on epidemiology, also four of the Helmholtz Center where I'm based in, in Munich at Helmholtz Munich and other federal institutions. And so we started out our baseline recruitment in 2014 to 2019. We are now well into the first re-examination, um, uh, which I describe a little bit more. And uh, you may imagine that we had quite challenging times over the last two years during the corona, corona pandemic. However, we are very happy, we, or we were very happy that we only needed to fully stop our re-examination for three months in total. And thereafter it could go on and, and kind of at least at a slower pace. We are now have been pledging for a second re-examination because we believe that the trajectories um, prospectively are really important to understand health changes. And also, as we know, hopefully we'll be moving um, out of or with the corona pandemic to normal, normal states. We think that the second re-examination will also provide very important uh, information and data. Um, we, we have our ongoing quality assessment data processing is in place and we follow the individuals for incident events over time. And this is the study design. We have a base, the baseline examination was divided in two parts. One is a standard examination, which was administered to everybody. And then which we call level one and the level two examination, which we aimed at doing in 40,000 people. But as you see here in the numbers, we actually in the end, administered to um, more than 55,000 people. And now we are um, basically moving forward with the um, first re-examination. Um, and in this meantime, we collect a number of uh, biomaterials and have a complete cooling chain 
from our um, study sites down to the final storage sites. And another important component of the study is that we are doing magnet resonance imaging at five of the sites. And again, I will explain our radiation, our, our imaging program in, in more detail. This is where we stand today. We have um, completed the baseline examination with more than 20, 205,000 individuals. We um, have currently uh, around 85,000 people re-examined of which um, 45,000 were after or during the corona pandemic, after the first lockdown in, in March, we started re-examining everybody in July. Um, and we are all working on our um, blood collection and also already have 12,000 re-exam images of those who receive, uh, so a third of those who receive the initial 30,000 images at baseline. And uh, one of the things we are proud of is that we were actually able to recruit um, the age and sex um, uh, individuals as planned. So we, um, we have 40,000 individuals, men and women uh, in the age range for 20 to 39. And the uh, other 160,000 are in the age range 40 to 69 years old. Um, we have in the 18 study center 16, which aimed at recruiting 10,000 individuals and two which go, which recruited 20,000, which to which also the study center I'm responsible in Augsburg belongs to. Um, and here you see that the distribution of the level two examinations and those who, of us who also run an, an MRI imaging center, um, we're doing more um, in-depth examination because everybody who receives an MRI also gets um, the in-depth examinations. One of the challenges we were facing in the baseline was actually the response rate. When we were planning the study, we were well aware that the UK Biobank, which started a decade earlier than us, had a response rate of maybe six to 10%. However, we thought we could do more in Germany and we're aiming at 50%. However, that really proved to be unrealistic. Um, you see that the study centers have different response rates ranging from 31% uh, down to 8%. And um, if one looks across the um, ages, it was turned out to be hardest to recruit though the very, uh, those in, uh, in their late 20s or early or 30s. Um, and it was also harder to recruit men than women. Um, and that in, as a result actually gives a very peculiar age and gender distribution because when we started out, it was easier to recruit the early, the um, older ages. And then so that in the middle part of the study, we really aim to increase the level of um, younger individuals as part of the study. And so um, this kind of brings me to what kind of data we actually collected. So we have the physical examinations, the interview, the questionnaires and the MRI together with the biomarkers and then uh, some COVID-19 data. And I will focus mainly on the um, examinations because I think that is something which makes the NACO unique. And um, you will see that, um, so I highlighted the um, examination modules with a picture and then you see the, here, this is the number, for example, for blood pressure of the baseline examination and down below, you see the planned numbers as of the re-examination. So with respect to cardiovascular disease, we measure blood pressure. We have an electrocardiography in the in-depth as well as the 3D echocardiography um, in the index and the long-term EKG in, in a sub-portion. The, the, we do ankle-branchial um, uh, ankle 
angle brachial index and pulse wave analysis in everybody. Similarly, for diabetes, we did an oral glucose tolerance test in nearly 20,000 and now do this volunteer as per some of the diabetes centers, which are, have a focus there. We do skin autofluorescence, pyrometry in everybody, which we also repeat in everybody, and exhaled nitric oxide measurements, which we did um, in the in-depth examination. We have for physical fitness, hand grip strength in everybody, and then uh, a 24 hour accelerometry in a subgroup, which we now are enlarging in the re-examination. We do seven day um, accelerometry again in the subgroup and ergometry in a, in a smaller portion, which is now also repeated. Uh, with respect to sensory system, we do a visual uh, acuity test and a retinal photography in the in-depth examination, a hearing test, as well as a smelling test. For neuro neurological and psychotic diseases, we have a neurocognitive test battery in everybody, and then the pretty pickboard uh, test for motor skills, um, we do, of course, body composition in everybody and have an abdominal ultrasound measurement, again, in our subgroup. Uh, we count tooth and do in-depth oral examinations. You may imagine that is for those were things we had to stop during the corona pandemic and now slowly bring it back to board. We had a hip knee measurement, which actually turned out to be quite challenging. And this is why we're not repeating it again. And we have an hand examination for joints uh, and for arthrosis and rheumatoid arthritis. And so um, to, with respect to the um, modules in the baseline level one examination, on average seven out of eight modules were repeated and it's actually 90, 93% got all eight modules. In the level two, it was eight models out of 10, and um, it's a smaller portion who got all 10 modules. And then we are really complete in interview and touch screen, which also has some in-depth information. Um, and what, what was really good is that we were able to keep these kind of completeness measures also now during the corona um, pandemic up and running. Um, although we had to um, post postpone a few examinations due to hygiene considerations. And so with that, I'm coming to our imaging component, which is a one hour whole uh, body MRI program, which focuses on the brain, the heart, the hip, the spine, and the fat distribution. It is a standardized, the same protocol at five, uh, the five MRI sites. And we use an uh, identical three Tesla Skyra scanner um, and have an incidental finding strategy and a thorough quality assurance. Um, and we are currently moving through the data exam um, abstraction and the first analyses. And I just brought a few examples to, to highlight what we are doing. So this is from um, papers which look at the uh, using images to uh, predict age in, within organs. Here's an example of the regional uh, brain prediction using machine learning in the brain. And you may see here that the um, kind of derived biological age is variable compared to the chronological age, although overall this follows um, a distinct line. And we also see um, the, uh, can describe the variability, which where you see that we have actually fewer individuals in the lower age ranges, that also why potentially the variability appears larger. Although I find it personally interesting that it's reduced um, it, at older ages. And this on the left-hand side, you see how, um, how this is compared to uh, deviation in, um, in Alzheimer patients so that indeed you can see differences 
when you look at the population based to the patients. And another example, which I thought it would be really interesting in moving forward is that um, this is a first analysis on um, pancreatic fat readings, comparing or integrating UK Biobank data and NACO data. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the original data and you may appreciate that the NACO has this wider age range while the UK Biobank has um, potentially has in the older age range more sample um, and that the distributions are different. However, if one applies machine learning algorithms to read the original images jointly, one can nicely um, kind of align these images. And I think this is important for future work to if one thinks of joint analysis of these large cohorts uh, around the globe. So that also on the image, on the reading of the original data, one needs to think and plan these analyses. This is a slide describing the follow-up activities which we are undergoing. In Germany, we do not have, for example, complete nationwide uh, registries uh, of hospital data like, some, like, for example, in the UK, which is why we need to actively pursue and ask questions, integrate the data, and validate the data. However, um, we are very happy that for the whole, the whole court, we are also establishing li record linkage. That is the one time first for Germany that we um, link to the statutory and the private health insurances, um, that we also link to the cancer registries, the um, uh, Central Research Institute for Ambulatory Healthcare, the statutory pension fund, and the um, Institute for Employment Research so that we get information, for example, if participants in the NACO get unemployed. And then we have a, a, a central mortality follow-up, which again is, is not what we usually do because then we need to go state by state, but for the NACO, this was possible to do jointly. And um, just a small vignette on our um, COVID um, research when we um, had to stop the re-examination in March, 2020, we, um, we issued um, a written questionnaire about COVID symptoms as well, or COVID incidences as well as mental health. And we're able to show as, as others that indeed um, the, um, the relative change to baseline of um, uh, the symptoms of depression, anxiety, and stress was visible both in men and women and was more so uh, in the younger age ranges quite significantly present. We have followed this um, analysis with a question on what were the reasons behind that. And here you see different models which kind of describe um, uh, a non-ingested model comparing the before after with respect to depression and anxiety. Um, then if we um, kind of adjusted for more variables, the effects were less likely to larger. And then when we adjusted for the changes in employment situation, insecurity regarding employment, working from home and change in the financial situation, this was at the very first time where the corona pandemic um, has not hit substantially, we could show that actually this substantially decrease this overall effect. So that it's indeed the social disparities which were, which were present already at that time and have increased by now, were responsible for these um, changes at large, at least in the data we have at hand. We just today issued another questionnaire and will follow up with a similar questions um, currently. And so with that, I'm moving into and the next very important part, namely the biosample ascertainment. And here you see the um, numbers for the baseline where we collected urine, blood, serum, 
plasma, erythrocytes, buffy code, and RNA samples. We have saliva for microbiome analysis, nasal swabs for microbiome, as well as stool samples. Um, and with the stool samples, we collect both um, stabilized stool as well as native and uh, naive stool for metabolomic analysis. This is all then stored in a central bio, um, bio repository, which we are building in Munich, which has two highly innovative storage systems, a semi-automated system for minus 80 degree storage and a fully automated system for minus 180 degree storage. And we house two, three, third, three fourths of all the samples centrally in Munich. And um, again, as the examinations, we are also aiming at uh, longitudinal biosamples. We focused on blood and urine in the first re-examination. And now for the second re-examination, we'll also be um, taking again uh, RNA samples and, um, and uh, stool samples. And with that, we hope to, we, we have stored these samples. And actually when we had the last renewal, we pledged for um, doing an MRI re-examination and did not go for molecular phenotyping. However, this is long overdue by now. Um, so that we have a genomic characterization and we are um, now working hard to have also our participants with an in intensified program for multi-omics analyses as well as viromics analyses. Um, for now, the third funding phase, we will start with genotyping and some standardized uh, coronavirus um, examinations. However, the, the vision is, of course, to add potential a lot of um, molecular layers, and we are discussing this now with various companies and hope that we will make progress in these arenas soon. Um, and one of the reasons why we are so interested in that is because we think that the epigenetic marks are really one of the hallmarks of understanding the interplay between the genetic and environmental exposures. And one, one recent paper of ours based on the CORA study was that we did a GVAS by a whole genome wide analysis, both for the single uh, nucleotide polymorphisms as well as the CPG sites. And we're able to uh, identify a large number of trans-regulated uh, um, uh, links between uh, single genetic variants and um, uh, methylation changes uh, at a distant at a distant site. And just one example of what this data gives one is that one can uh, um, identify proteins like this uh, tyrosine phos uh, phosphatase which then is linked to, um, uh, has been linked to be a play a role in gestational calorie restriction and also is, in, uh, is thought to program a susceptibility to obesity and other chronic diseases. And indeed, um, this, um, uh, the SNP in the gene is influencing both DNA methylation and BMI. And one has these, um, therefore, is providing a link how potentially uh, gestational calorie restriction together with genetic variation could play a role. However, as, um, and, and so we think that this, you, one can identify novel sites, which could be a potential mediator of both genetic and environmental exposures underlying adipose tissue at adiposity and cardiometabolic diseases. However, I think this is also very important for future for the future and stand, understanding the complexity of environmental exposures. And together with um, Tim Navot from Belgium and um, Andrea Baccarelli, who is now at Columbia but was at Harvard Chan before. Um, we wrote a concept paper where we thought that like the hallmarks of aging, also the joint environmental exposures have specific molecular 
um, signatures, which in part overlap with the hallmarks of aging. And, um, and so the epigenetic marks are one of them. And indeed, one of the first results we um, had together with um, colleagues from the Harvard, Harvard School of Public Health was that we were the first to link ambient air pollution and elevations over a month to changes in epigenetic marks. However, I think we still do not understand what we are really looking at. And I think it's important to move forward and use these large scale databases to really advance the understanding how um, the, the general pathways to disease interlink with the environmental exposures. And um, one of the efforts we are, have been involved in is looking at air pollution. We do so in Europe combining across cohorts. Um, and um, one of the recent paper of my group was that we actually looked in uh, at air pollution and stroke and coronary events, and we're able to demonstrate in um, based on the collection of eight, uh, six European cohorts, that there is a clear link between NO2 and an increased risk for stroke, uh, as well as fine particulate matter and stroke. However, in Europe, these um, different indices are highly correlated. And so this is a remaining questions to further entangle, disentangle their joint effects. And for coronary events, we had um, evidence for an increase um, uh, in relationship to NO2, but not with fine particulate matter. So that now these, um, NACO provides a possibility because we find large scale variation in these two regions, and they are well above the current WHO um, guidelines. Uh, there were, and they are also well below um, the um, current standard we have in the European Union, and we, which we hope we will be changing within the coming months or, or one or two years. And. Um, so with that, one of the things we'll be adding to the NACO is an environmental data unit, which we will be housing at, um, at the Helmholtz Center. And what I find really important is that this will give us the opportunity to also look at the um, impact of climate change, because here you see the number of heat days um, in 2001. And this compared to the year 2015, where the number of heat, where heat days has really substantially increased in Germany. And what is interesting is that 2015 is not the record high year in, um, in Germany. So it's, it's in the re recent ranking, it's, it's at rank of, uh, it's in the upper 10, but, but it's not the hottest year. And, and so we, we have this variability, which we think is really important to make, to make people to, to drive the issue home that this is happening now, and this is also affecting our health now. And so let me end with the um, description how NACO data can be accessed. We, are, we only grant access to quality assured data, which distinguishes us from the UK Biobank. Um, and so this is a major process which is currently ongoing. Um, and so we have, um, uh, we have a transfer hub, which currently is open to German uh, scientists, but because currently still our, all the legal framework of the NACO is only available in German, but we are working on the translation as well as the internationalization of that. And here you find, and there, so there is a process to write a data application, which is then reviewed by use and access board. If approved, um, there is a process of a contract negotiation in order to comply with the data protection rules of the European Union, and then the data is, is supplied. And uh, this is a picture um, and the website for the NACO transfer hub and um, where you find the digital data dictionary and study documents. Um, we have also 
um, and uh, and a non yet non authorized um, English version, which you are very happy to um, uh, receive if you contact me, and which also will be hopefully online um, soon. Uh, we are striving at integrating the NACO data with other um, European endeavors, such as, um, for example, and making uh, the, the German genome phenome archive, um, which we link to and which also links into the EGA system, uh, the European uh, genome archive. And with that, I'm coming to the end. Um, so this is a rich uh, resource which uh, provides a wealth of data. And if I can uh, pose a wish for potentially future collaboration, I think what is really missing, and you may have guessed that from my presentation, is to really um, enter more into causal inference frameworks with this unique data. And which I think is, is really ideal to um, use uh, try out match, matched um, approaches as well as others. And with the um, global changes, I think one of the most challenging things we face currently is to really evaluate these changes which occur over time. And I think you need trajectories and repeated measurement data to do so. Um, and you need the right methods. And that's why I'm so pleased that I was able to present this um, data set here today and I'm very much looking forward to potential uh, future collaborations. Um, and if you want to read more, there's a paper in press uh, which describes the, um, the German national cohort. And with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>